All right, so let's assume that we're alive. And let me say good morning to people and thank you for attending. Happy Valentine's Day. And I'm Mark Schwartz and this is Lori Galperin. And we're gonna be talking to you about the topic of repetition compulsion, which we think is very fitting for a Valentine's Day. And um, just as way of introduction, Lori and I run Harmony Place Monterey, and it's a partial hospitalization program for people who have four subspecialty areas, one post-traumatic stress and complex trauma, two eating disorders, three chemical dependency, and four addiction and varieties of sorts. And what we do is six hours a day of programming, and some people live in our housing, and what we do is we have tracks and give people fairly intensive treatment with three to four individual sessions a week. And we welcome you. And with no further ado, we're going to go ahead and begin. I wanted to just start with the story, which is what I usually start with. Um, and on this first slide, you have pictures of some monkeys that were out of Harlow's lab. And uh, I got a chance to work in Harlow's lab with these monkeys 40 years ago. And they were called the motherless mother monkeys. And they were artificially inseminated. And what you see is a really rather unique phenomena, which is the male monkeys and the female monkeys had the same amount of trauma, which was Harry Harlow attempting to hurt them by the tribe of peers and mothers. And when they got older, the male monkeys would strike out and attack, and the female monkeys would bite themselves. In the bottom right-hand corner, you see the female biting herself. So the same amount of trauma had a very different effect on the brain of the monkey. But the female monkey, when given the right stimulus situation, which meant we are officially inseminated, she tried to kill her own infant, which is at the top there. And if you think about what happens with humans, you have a certain amount of neglect and deprivation. Men tend to act out and hurt people sometimes, and women tend to act in and hurt themselves. And so my suspicion is, is that the brains are wired differently in response to trauma. And one of the ways that people hurt themselves is to pick destructive relationships and then actively repeat. So what I find is that in relationships, it's an active process. And whatever's unfinished from the family of origin oftentimes gets repeated, reenacted, and actively recreated in the relationship. So I think this is sort of the big mystery, which almost nobody talks about. I, I have my friend Bessel Vanderkolk when he first wrote that article that on reenactment 25 years ago, I said, why is it that nobody talks about this stuff? It's just amazing how ubiquitous it is in all relationships. Um, and still, since the analysts, I, I don't find <clears throat> many people really have cornered in on this aspect of reenactment. So I think we're going to talk historically this morning about uh, this his, the history of this concept. And then we're going to talk clinically, really, about what we do with clients so that they can move towards what we call earn secure attachment and not necessarily repeat or reenact the bodies of ways. Well, many of you know who Alice Miller was. And um, Alice Miller was originally trying to figure out many things, one of which was how did, how did the Nazi situation in Germany come about? And could it come about elsewhere? And she was trying to look at the roots of child rearing as creating either fertile ground or not so fertile ground for the kinds of things that took place later that would constitute the atrocities and the silence of the Holocaust. And um, in the last slide, you saw that Selma Freiberg talked about that the key in some ways to not repeating is really to still remember, to still remember what it felt like to be 
the child to still remember what it felt like to be an adolescent, to still remember what it felt like. But often we forget in order to survive and then we never go back and recall what it truly feels like. And instead, we do, I think, what is comparable to what children do, but at an adult level. So children enact things by doll play and by play and by um, creating circumstances. And you can see them sometimes playing with dolls in a way where you think, oh my goodness, what are they enacting there? Because it's way beyond the range of what they're familiar with. And often it's some interaction they've seen and they're, it's almost as though they're trying to understand it by recreating it. And I think later in life, that's exactly what we do. We try to somehow um, come to grips with or assimilate things that were once too overwhelming, too beyond our capacities or resources or neural pathways to integrate at the time. So what Alice Miller said about this in this particular slide is that there is a usefulness though to reenacting and nevertheless the need to repeat also has a positive side repetition is the language used by a child who has remained dumb as in not speaking his or her only means or their only means of expressing himself a dumb child needs a particularly empathic empathetic partner if he is to understand it at all Speech, on the other hand, is often used less to express genuine feelings and thoughts than to hide, veil, or deny them, and thus to express the false self. And so there are often long periods in working with clients in which we are dependent on their compulsion to repeat, for this repetition has been the only manifestation of their true self. So let me use an example to make this uh, kind of concept become clinically useful. Um, I use myself as an example. So uh, if you can turn back to that slide, please, Susan. The, what you see in that is that um, there was a time, for example, when I went to visit my family. And when I visited my family, you know, I put on a role, a false self. And basically, as I act out that role, I become like an actor on a stage. And then what happens is, is that um, I find myself being very, very silent and not being able to carry on a conversation. And it occurred to me in retrospect that I was acting a lot like I did when I was a teenager, when I was like 13. And so I realized that when I'm in that stimulus situation, what I get triggered is that part of me pops out, which is 13 years old, and that's the age when my father dropped dead. And so some start of me, some part of me came stuck at that stage. So by using that example, then what we're talking about a true self, oftentimes is parts of self become manifested in stimulus situations. And those parts of self be, be, have become disowned in some ways in the psychoanalytic concept. And reowning those parts then uh, is what is called integration. And when you can integrate disowned parts, the result of that is you feel generally happier and more like yourself. And so a lot of our therapy is oriented now towards integration. Dan Siegel, as he talks about linkages and brain development, he sees this as not just psychological, but actually in the brain itself, that these linkages and integration are necessary for positive health. And even in looking at effects of a lot of the pharmacological agents, it's allowing neurons to begin to link together with other neurons to allow the system to work in a more integrated way. However, initially, not everybody so welcomes these lost parts of self because often the reason we exile aspects of ourselves or of our experience at the time is that it's too much. And so we have the anticipation that to feel it again will subject us to the possibility of being overwhelmed and overrun by emotions that were too much at the time. And so it becomes essential to begin to do the kind of integrative work that is necessary, but not alone. 
as the person perhaps was originally. So speaking now back about 30 to 40 years, um, Lori and I were working in a clinic and we were noticing that uh, we were working with men who molested children. And what we noticed was that a vast majority of them had a history of child sexual abuse. And it always seemed bizarre to me that if someone had had a horrible thing happen to them as a child, why would they want to go and do that to someone else? Because logically you think, well, if I experience that suffering and pain, the last thing I want to do is cause that to someone else. And that was around the same time that was coming out that a lot of times the mothers who were physically abusing their children had been physically abused themselves. But Kemp was working in Colorado. And so this idea of repetition seemed to me so uh, illogical in some ways. It, nobody really believed it actually until some of these data got published. And the leading covariant factor in child sexual abuse, as you see in this slide, um, was being molested yourself. So the basic question comes into, why is it that a person who has a traumatic experience in childhood might enact it? At that time, we thought to ourselves, victims oftentimes become victimizers and victimize themselves or others in a variety of ways. So, you know, you have a woman, for example, who cuts on herself or headbangs and as a result of being abused in some way. And the question is, why would a person hurt themselves who is being hurt? And I think that what I'm saying is, is that our question today, which is why you choose a mate, for example, who you're picking your third alcoholic husband when your father was alcoholic, is probably similar to why it is that a person who's a victim oftentimes victimizes themselves. And we want to begin to try to answer that question. Um, the patient is obliged to repeat the, the repressed what's that? memories. Repressed memories. As a contemporary experience, instead of remembering it as something belonging to the past, the patient remembers nothing of what is forgotten, but he expresses it in an attempt to achieve mastery over a traumatic situation. So the idea is that if one could repeat, not repeat, but instead remember and integrate and witness and make sense of and incorporate the things that had happened that were overwhelming at the time or that were too much or that a person didn't have the ability to make sense of because there were too many irreconcilable pieces of it. If a person could do that, then they wouldn't feel the need to recreate the same scenario over and over again. But the idea is that people repeat rather than remember. And that's what makes the world go round. And so it really brings up actually the idea of free will. And I tend to think that though we have free will, our will is not quite as free as we think it is when we're obliged to attempt to work out things that happened years ago by recreating them in a veiled way in our current lives and not seeing it as such. Okay, so there's a lot on this, but the next sort of piece of this came from the analysts. And those of you who read Robert Stoller, um, he was great in the sense that he was trying to understand perversion, where people's sexuality becomes fused together with hostility. And what he said, which was quite dramatic for his time, was that Perversion is the actual reliving of a historic sexual trauma aimed at one's sex and gender identity. And the past is rubbed out. This time, trauma is turned into pleasure, orgasm, and victory. And why historically that was so important is because he was the first person to begin to say that there's actual trauma in the history of somebody who has twisted sexuality. Um, and that it comes in a sense that, that a person can't get rid of the danger, so they repeat it again and again. So there's been various theories about reenactment. One of them is, is that a person's trying to finish or complete something. Another one is, is that a person's feeling of being out of control needs to get in control. 
or that the brain gets stuck. I think John Breer once said that there's a repeater system in the brain, like the Zygarnik effect. When something's unfinished, you have to just repeat it over and over until it's complete or finished in some ways. But all of these were sort of theoretically um, profound, I guess, and made a lot of sense. And so I just gave a lot of quotes, even up to Winnicott, where the concept of fixation, which came from Freud, Winnicott took to another level and said, that, you know, a person gets stuck at what we might call T minus one in contemporary talk. That at a, at a point where a person is traumatized, something gets stuck. And I think all of that was a forecast of where we are today, which is that the nature of trauma is that there is a dissociative experience. And if Janet would have been more well read than Freud, then perhaps we would have understood better dissociative theory. But dissociative theory suggests that the nature of trauma is that somehow a person gets stuck at the point of the trauma and some part of them stays there in a fixated sort of way. So as we've done more gestalt work, we recognize and call that parts. Parts of self or dissociated aspects of the personality that sort of get stuck. And so often what we find is that, um, that these parts manifest themselves in the therapy hour. And so all of a sudden you get a child's voice coming out of the client or the person begins to act in a way that's not like them. And when you check what that is, what you find is that they, they seem to be stuck at some injured part of self that was there for the trauma. For example, yesterday I was working with somebody who's really filled with rage and anger. And he, the situation was quite trivial, but he was completely out of control of the anger. And when I brought him into the session, I mean, he literally was in a flashback. And he was back home in his family house and the anger that he was feeling towards a woman was the anger he felt towards his own mother and he had no control over that affect so when affect is out of control and unlike the person and basically the person had no voluntary control over it you know that a person has some sort of trauma that we need to begin to go back and finish in some way well i like to broaden it actually um, to go beyond trauma because, let's see if I can formulate this. Um, the way I think about it is much more intergenerational. So as an example, if you all will bear with me for a few minutes, um, a lot of our forebearers came to the country of America. Well, some of them came in chains and some of them came to escape oppression. So the ones that saw America as the place of freedom um, had to sort of hit the ground running and deal with poverty and lots of mouths to feed and a different language and getting planted and dealing with day to day um, practicalities. So there wasn't a whole lot of time to deal with whatever the original things were that sent them across the seas. Other people landed here and their trauma began um, deeply because they were brought here in a way that was traumatic. So many generations of people who are here set about to try to make a better life for the next generation. And there wasn't really the um, time sometimes, sometimes not really the help, sometimes not really the inclination on the part of some people to look back and to integrate and to resolve things that had happened previously. But those things don't go away. They come out in behavior and they're a legacy that's left to the next generation to work out. Then of course the next generation feels kind of guilty. Like, oh my God, everyone sacrificed for me and I'm messed up and I have no reason to be such a mess because, you know, I've had everything. But the burdens of the past generation don't just disappear. Um, and the shame of prior generations 
in terms of the things that they were forced to be, to do, to witness, um, it doesn't vanish. And so we're a strangely ahistorical culture, and I think it's something to do with our independence and autonomy that says, you know, regardless of where we've come from, we can do anything we want. And I think that's actually beautiful and inspiring. However, um, I think the part that makes us shave off the past as though it never happened is unnecessary and that you can't really understand yourself without understanding the last couple of generations and understanding history at the very least. And so, um, I wish that there were some way that we could get out of a blame mentality because that's what we're steeped in as a shame-based culture. You know, it's like, well, who's to blame for this? I did the best I could. And I, I wish that we could throw that out entirely and just put the pieces of the puzzle together in a way that allows us to see what's been transmitted down the generational lines and what there is yet to deal with and to heal and to work through and to free ourselves from so that in reality, we have a greater freedom of choice. All right, so let's sort of summarize what we've said so far. I had a group yesterday and in that group, I said to people, um, let's talk about choice of partners. And each of the people in the room talked about how their relationships in the past had been difficult and they had chosen partners who were um, uh, difficult for them, where there had been some violence, where there had been some sort of um, uh, injury and that it was repeated over and over and over again. And when I asked them sort of what they had learned so far about how to change that, each of them had a statement which had something to do with free will. Like I need to learn what I'm doing wrong, or I need to pick different kind of men or women, or I need to um, make peace with my parents, or some sort of statement, which I would call something between them and the other person. And I think that's the common way of thinking about this. And so the result is, is that when you pick another destructive relationship, you end up blaming yourself, thinking, oh, God, you know, what am I ever going to learn? And I think that that may be necessary, but not sufficient. Because I think the real change for partner choice comes from beginning to look inside rather than outside and to begin to look at one's relationship with oneself. And so a lot of what we've been doing over the last 10 years is using attachment theory to help people begin to develop a secure relationship with themselves. And to be able to do that, we help them find the injured parts of self, in this case, the lost, lonely adult. And what we find is, is that most of the clients, they turn to addiction, whether it be work or whether it be addiction to uh, sex or addiction to alcohol or drugs. Um, or even addictive relationships to feel the emptiness within themselves and what they're most afraid of is being alone. And so they stay with somebody out of fear of being alone, out of real love. And so what we want to talk about today is how to begin to change the internal script so that a person can structurally change their relationship with self, which then ultimately will change their choice of partner. You say that any better than me? Probably not. However, I will add additional things to muddy it further. Um, so when I talk about this, I'm not just thinking about trauma or unusual circumstances. I often say things like, with regard to childhood, no one escapes unscathed. You know, childhood is not easy. I mean, you have less power than you will later have. You're dependent on other people for many things, and you haven't had a lot of time on the planet to know how things work and how they don't work and how to 
accomplish things. So you don't have much efficacy yet built up or much mastery built up just by definition. So childhood is hard and adolescence is hard. And, you know, then you have people telling you, oh, these are the best years of your life. And you're thinking to yourself, oh my God, I'm doomed. So in any event, um, everyone, everyone, maybe a couple of people are the exceptions to this, but almost everyone has to exile aspects of self in order to get what's gettable in their attachment environment while growing up. So when we talk about this, we're not talking about extraordinary circumstances necessarily. We're talking about circumstances that are standard and that require us to, again, shave off and exile aspects of our being in order to get love, in order to get approval, in order to not disappoint someone, in order not to put extra burdens on someone we love. So it's not all about and it's not all about necessarily what parents do. I mean, parents can be extraordinary. And still, the unfinished business from the past will permeate in whatever ways it can find an opening. And so I think it's absolutely essential for any person who wants to understand themselves and life around them to be able to go back and rethink the past based on current wisdom and to examine anew um, the rules and the implicit assumptions that were made while growing up. In fact, I think it's probably, if I'm not fond of obligation, but it's probably an obligation to do so, not just in order not to pass things along to the next generation, but the change has to be internal. And that's what Mark's talking about. The change has to originate in our relationship with self and relationship with these disowned parts of self. And one last thought about this is when we exile ourselves out of a desire to stay away from pain, the problem is that we also exile vital parts of ourselves that were once a key to our aliveness. And we're, we think they're like ruined and burdened to the point where there's no redemption. And so if we could just get rid of it, it's like, you know, the latest diet, if we could just lose five pounds and if that five pounds were this part that acts in a way that's unacceptable to me, but nothing can be transformed without original acknowledgement in any relationship and especially the relationship with oneself. So let's move from theory to contemporary neuroscience. And two things about Alan Shore in his work on affect development in the brain and Dan Siegel, which is that they used attachment theory and the data that had been collected over the last 30 years to recognize that development is sequential and ongoing and that what occurs is that you can't look at the cause of a behavior what you have to look at is the trajectory which is the pathway and so the first event occurs which then affects the second event and that second event then is reciprocal and affects the person on the other side so that you know the person might have difficulties at home and then have difficulty in the playground difficulty with the teacher and the teacher is mean to them, and the kids bully them, and then things happen after that. So sequential, mutually driven processes occur and change the person. And that the key aspect of this then is that it's written into the affect. And so <clears throat> there are three components of the change process for the clinician. One of them is going to be in the attachment system, which we'll be talking about. The second is affect, which is uh, being able to look at affect as a trigger for a lot of these events. And so what happens is, is that an event occurs and the person isn't conscious in their neocortex 
of what it is that's affecting them, i.e. it's unconscious, and it triggers <coughs> a response that's about the past rather than about the present. And a person gets familiar. So let's use as an example, why would somebody pick an alcoholic husband three times in a row? And what is it that they're picking up? And they'll come in and they'll say, well, he wasn't drinking when I met him. You know, how did I know that he was going to become alcoholic? Well, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? So what is it that the person is picking up? I became curious about this because, you know, there was all this talk about, well, if people can't remember things in the first three or four years of their life. And I thought to myself, well, you know, that can't be true. If a child's left in the crib for the first year of life, they may not remember being left in the crib, but there's some residue of that throughout their entire life because it affects the brain and obviously behavior and affect and cognition. And so how do we understand that? And as neuroscience has developed, we're beginning to look at there are these events that record on these dendrites that are like memory and that the brain kind of recognizes them as familiar in some way. The most vivid example I got of this was sort of through, through a sense of smell. When I was young, uh, my mom was from, from Hungary. And so uh, she would make stuffed cabbage, which had this very pungent odor. And if I smell stuffed cabbage now, I can feel in my brain, in my entire body, some real transformation that occurs. Uh, the, there's a certain emotional feeling that goes with it. There's a physiologic feeling. And I can just imagine if I was in a PET scan, my brain would be on fire. It just lights up all over the place. And so there's a familiarity that gets attached to that. And it becomes something that, you know, you move towards. And so I love, you know, eating stuffed cabbage. Um, and it has an emotional significance for me. Well, whatever that's about, I think we're talking about something similar when you meet a person in the room and you say, this is the person I'm going to marry, and you haven't even met them first. There's something your brain is recognizing, which is familiar, and it may be good or it may be bad. And that insight is quite important because I think that's what took Harville Hendricks um, and uh, the, the, to recognize this idea of the imago, uh, which we're going to be talking about in a bit, which I think is at the very basis of what happens with early memory and Helen Hunt, of course. Okay. So then what we're saying then is, is that the eyes of the mother, Winnicott said, are the child's first mirror. And so I'll never forget at a conference watching the Bay's uh, videotapes. And what she would show is that you know, in the first moments of life, the mother would smile and the baby would smile one second later on the videotape. Or and less. How in the hell does the baby recognize that? And what she said was that the brain of the baby is hardwired to the mom's brain through mirror neurons. And that was an exciting concept because you know, if the mother has postpartum depression or the mother is incredibly anxious herself or depressed, you can just see how that could be transmitted in some ways. And then we had this training um, by, uh, in, a, in the attachment work. And the most interesting example was that um, Patricia Crittenden showed us these babies and the babies were with mothers who had been having postpartum depression, but the mothers had been trained to be good enough mothers. And so the mothers were smiling and rocking their babies and happy and playing with their babies. And she asked 100 people in the audience, is this secure attachment or some other disordered attachment? And everybody in the audience raised their hand, this was secure attachment. And then she stopped the videotape at some point, and the mother turned her head and she had this look of depression on her face. And you could see she was acting like a good, good enough mother, but that she was actually very depressed. And then they turned to the baby and the baby became completely disengaged and, and disoriented when that happened. And when those babies were followed up, they were insecurely attached. And so the point then being that 
a baby can accurately recognize when a mom's pretending to be a good enough mother versus a mother who is um, in actuality having tremendous disturbance herself. And so, you know, when you say to the client, tell me a little bit about your interaction with your parents growing up, is the story that they're telling, you know, what goes into the conscious neocortex, or is it something that affect has transmitted into the system, into the brain? Because the child's going to interpret the mother who's depressed as a mother who's unloving. But they won't know they're interpreting it that way, so they'll just get screwed up. Exactly. So the way I sense this is that, you know, after 40 years, I, I think I've changed the way I do therapy. Because I think what I realized is that when I'm dealing with, it, with addictions, and by addictions, I'm talking about people who turn to alcohol and drugs, but also people who just, you know, have completely become alone, even with people. And, you know, they have this great sense of, of, of aloneness. You know, they go into work, they just get busy doing some obsessive task, anything to avoid connection. That all seems to me addiction. And at the core of addiction is the addictive personality. And the addictive personality is this big black hole in the middle of your stomach, the sense of emptiness. And that black hole is an absence of a sense of self. You, the person will verbalize it. I don't know who I am. I feel like an imposter. I feel like I'm bad acting to be good. I feel like I deserve bad things to happen to me. And if you feel like you're ugly or you feel like you're bad or you feel like you're damaged, um, what kind of partner are you going to pick? If they're extraordinary, you're going to feel anxious all the time because what are the, when is the next shoe going to drop? When are they going to discover that you're an imposter and, and dump you and leave you in some ways? So what happens is there's a reactive distance. And so you have to keep yourself distant from them to prepare for them leaving you in some way. And so you, you find a hundred ways to distance yourself from the person and uh, you end up being highly reactive. So the clients that we serve mostly with eating disorders, they have what we call otherization, meaning that they are so sensitive that they're constantly looking at how the other person is going to react to them. And so much of their false self behavior is in reaction to their anticipation of how the other person can be. And their whole identity is, is around reactivity, which then keeps them from really developing any core sense of self. So just to elaborate, perhaps unnecessarily, um, the void that you're talking about, the black hole, just to tie it in with what I said previously, it's where those parts would be that are exiled. It's where perhaps the most vulnerable, um, life-affirming, curious, desiring to connect parts of you once were, who took on burdens, as Dick Schwartz would say, Dick Schwartz, the originator of internal family systems, it's where those parts once were, but when those parts took on burdens, um, i.e. feelings or beliefs or having experiences that cause them to feel shame, to feel overwhelmed, to feel pain, when you somehow exile, and by exiling, I mean, you know, either you put things in like little Tupperware containers and clip them and put them neatly in the attic labeled, or, and then never go back up there if you can help it. And then one day somehow something, there's an earthquake and the Tupperware falls over and something starts to open up and you do everything in your power to get it resealed. And, you know, another way of thinking of it is the, the parts of yourself that you send to your dungeon and lock up and hope and let them serve a life sentence there um, for crimes that were not theirs originally. But in any event, the hole that's formed by the sending away of these aspects of ourselves creates a lack of ability to really connect with self and with others and with the world around us 
and therefore we need pseudo experience, pseudo um, intimacy, pseudo intensity in order to feel something. And that is what creates um, an addictive system. It's the need to substitute something that feels enlivening for what's been necessarily exiled. And so when we talk about integration, um, it's because there's no choice but restoration uh, of the self to the self or else life is just more of an endurance contest where you're seeing if you're going to get through it. And I don't necessarily mean that you're going to go, you know, shoot heroin. I mean, you might be a workaholic and you might uh, choose acquisition, let's say, as your drug of choice. And it might not be that anyone will send you to a treatment center for that. However, there's this emptiness um, and it's the emptiness I think people feel sometimes upon retirement because their reason for living uh, no longer exists and they have to face the internal emptiness. And with internal emptiness, it's very hard to have the presence that allows true intimacy with anyone or anything else. Which is why Harlow could be like the mingle of the monkey world and subject monkeys to the things he did in order to prove things about human beings that really don't we already know? But that's just a commentary. And Okay, so Robert Carrot in his book, Becoming Attached, says this so perfectly. He says, the internal models of very young children are particularly subject to distortion because they misinterpret the meaning of the parents' communications. They feel hatred and rejected as a result of untimely separations. They interpret outlay rejecting behavior as proof that they're not loved. They draw conclusions. I'm responsible for mommy's drinking. <coughs> if I were a better child, she'd be a happier person. That bear no relation to the facts. Um, they lack the cognitive sophistication to think through the implications of what they feel. <coughs> as Mary Maida Berkeley notes, anyone will feel unlovable if the person he's most attached to is rejecting. So therein lies the core. And so a person comes into your office, they're an extraordinary, unique human being. You see it, and they feel defective, they feel bad. And so, you know, you use cognitive based therapy and you get them to, you know, kind of challenge their self statements. And that works for about three to six months sometimes. Um, and then they go back to feeling the way they did before. And then you think maybe I didn't do the therapy right, or maybe Beck could do it better. So I was really interested. I went to hear Jeffrey Young, who was one of Beck's colleagues, and he said that I worked in Beck's lab for a period of time and I realized that cognitive therapy doesn't work with personality disorders, and all my clients have personality <coughs> disorders. So that's really an interesting concept. All my clients have personality disorders. Hmm. Now think about that for a minute. You sit there and you say to the client, you're extraordinary. How can you believe that to be true? And I think that's what a lot of supportive psychotherapy does. And I want to suggest to you that that doesn't work. It, it, it's, a, it's the wrong model. You might get changes on their forms that you fill out on self-esteem temporarily so they can make you look good, but it doesn't really change because these things are engrammed into the core structures of the brain and they're engraved with affect. And so they still feel defective and bad about themselves. And so the question is, the question of the day is, how do you go in that brain and begin to change the very structure of the affect-ridden false conclusions about self and other? And Oftentimes, they're written into the concept of trauma. Trauma is an event that cannot be assimilated or accommodated. So if you think about this, what's the worst trauma a person can have? Perhaps a mother who's incapable of loving them, because uh, we don't even know how to define love. But the child senses feeling unloved in some coarse or sense of way. And when that child senses that, they feel defective and bad. 
And how does one change that engraved structure in the brain? And that's what I want to say something about this morning. So what happens is that, you know, you pick the third mate that beats you up or has affairs or does something to hurt you. And what you do is you blame yourself and say, when am I going to learn? Why do I keep doing this? I better just stay away from people. And so what you do is you go into a state of deprivation and then you're so starved for love because the life force takes over, you're lonely, uh, you're scared, you're needy, and the next person comes along and you glub onto them uh, and hope that maybe this time you can make a change. And, you know, what one great marital therapist says is that instead of divorcing your spouse, maybe you need to divorce your family of origin. And what they mean is, is that it's time to go back and look at the schema that have been built into your brain around your family of origin and begin to work around those core schema, not beat yourself up for picking the wrong partner. And you know that has to do with this concept that's on this slide, which is that the arrested child and looking for someone to take care of them in some way. So you know the, that's the ultimate reenactment is that you know if as a child your parents were drunks for example and you never got parenting at age two or four or six or eight or ten or twelve or fourteen well you know the brain needs certain things at those ages you need to learn how to be with people you need to learn how to be with the environment you need to make meaning and sense out of the world around you parenting is a complex phenomenon it's that the child goes out and has all kinds of experiences and has to come in and process them. If there's no one to process them with, the child is left with an empty slate. And so they go out and as an adult, that injured part of self is still there. They get bigger and older, but that injured self is still there and they feel anxious. And there's a strong yearning. Could someone please love me? Could someone take care of me? Could someone please, you know, be there for me when I need them. Can somebody have my back? And Bowlby talked about this when he talked about, you know, secure base. A secure base is creating an environment where there's somebody out there who really has your back. And we need a secure base to go out and explore our environment. And, you know, the truth is, is that you do that, you need to have trust. You need to have safety. You need to have to feel powerful. And you have to need to be able to be in control. All those are schema, and those schema are damaged. And until you can repair those four schema, what a person does is they use money or they use sex or they use alcohol as a way of feeling safety, trust, esteem, power, and control. And is, until those schema change, you're not going to get any real change. That's why cognitive therapy doesn't work. It's necessary, but maybe not sufficient. Now, as many of you know, I had the good fortune of spending five years with John Money at Johns Hopkins. And you know, he was a great genius. And um, he talked about this concept of vandalized love maps. And he said, it's like native language. It differentiates within the first few years of life before there's long-term memory. And there's a template in the mind and in this template, it comes out in mental images and fantasies uh, later. And when he was talking about love maps, he wasn't just talking about sex. He was also talking about the capacity to bond and care and connect. And so when I would think about love maps, I'm talking not just about romantic relationships, but I'm talking about a core relational con conflict where the person the way they connect to friends, the way they connect to bosses, the way they connect to all people is um, in the same core sort of way. So in attachment theory, which you know, money was really anticipating, people who are avoidant avoid connection with all people and are so alone. People who are preoccupied glob onto people and feel dependent and needy or feel rageful and angry because people don't meet their needs. They get the two sides of the coin of the preoccupied. And then the disorganized, they go back and forth between, I don't need anybody, 
to being overly dependent and going back and forth with that in some ways. And those are the vandalized love maps. And the question is, how does one change one's love map? How does one change their attachment style? And even though we now have studied this for 30 to 40 years, um, the real question is, how do you move towards an insecure attachment? And um, then if you can understand that, how does one have earned secure attachment with oneself as opposed to others? And that's really what we're talking about in the vandalized love map. Let me see if I can actually uh, synthesize some of what you've been talking about. Do you mind if I, or am I gonna interrupt your flow? No, I'm done. Okay. Um, so, if you can't have a sense of intimacy, what does that actually mean? Intimacy would be, um, the definition that I've liked best of it is maybe the presence of self-disclosure. This would mean actual self-disclosure, not false self. And the availability of an empathic response, uh, not not help, not redemption, not repudiation, but just empathy. I think people misunderstand what empathy is sometimes. So what interferes with it is that if, as Mark's talking about, as a child, you learned that certain parts of yourself can't be revealed because they're not okay and you'll meet with the same fate you did when you tried to reveal them originally. Um, then your level of availability for true intimacy is injured. Alternatively, if what you learned as a child was, oh, the way I can get my needs for being taken care of dealt with is by taking care of others. So then you go out into the world, you're at great risk to become a therapist, but or a nurse or some other caregiver in a way that you do it 24 seven. And there's a idea at the very root of it that somehow if I do it well enough, then I'll have earned the right and the ability and someone to do it for me. And both of these survival strategies, um, I guess, make a lot of sense in the original environment in which they form, but later become encumbrances that actually keep us from true relationship with others and with ourselves. So, um, you know, in my, in, my, um, in my day, but yes, in my day, there were fairy tales like, and I guess there still are, you know, Cinderella and Snow White and all those things in which um, the idea of a savior of some sort riding in on a white horse or something was perpetuated. And I think that regardless of fairy tales in their presence or absence, no offense to the fairies, um, what happens is that many of us are looking externally for a redeemer. And as many smart people in various fields have said, we often look for someone, and we'll get to this a lot like the people that we needed it from originally and got some version of it, but are wanting whatever was missing at an even deeper level. So we're looking for like, you know, the blessing, the acceptance, the redemption, the salvation uh, of someone else, heroic, perhaps. But it'll ha But if they're really heroic, then we are scared that we are not going to measure up. So we have to carefully manage what we present to them in order not to meet with the same fate. So the big secret is everyone wants to reveal themselves, and yet people are tremendously afraid to, and it leaves an incredible emptiness because you get pseudo self, not really the self, and you get people interacting with other people 
as objects. So now this is important enough to say a bit about it. So there's a way in which you can interact with people as objects and not as who they are. And when, whenever you've been in a relationship, let's say, and you thought, what the hell is going on here? Somebody didn't give me a script and I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. It might have been happening that you were engaged in someone else's enactment of something unfinished, something that they hoped would turn out differently this time when they recreated it, but didn't know that consciously. And that, and that somehow your scenario fit with theirs uh, in a way where the probability is that the same thing is going to happen that always happen. And so the problem with interacting with people as objects is you use other people for various things, whether, and I'm not just talking about sexuality, that's the least of it. It's like you use the person as the surrogate parent that you need and kill all the eroticism from the relationship because being a parent and being a lover don't quite go together. And so I think this is worth looking at because we use people kind of like substances instead of being able to use and instead of being able to access the humanity of ourselves and of the other person. And it's only under those circumstances that anything novel can occur. And so we get bored and so it feels empty. And so we change partners and go on to the next thing, leaving wreckage behind us many times and enact a similar scenario. And well, let me, let me kind of say something about that. You can. Okay. So let, let's just take your exact words. I want to chat about this. So let's just take what Lori just said, which is, you know, you use people like you use a substance. Um, let me do an aside for a minute. Last night I was looking, listening to NPR and they had a, a neuropsychologist on, and she was explaining addiction. And what she said is it's sort of like a sleeping pill. If you take a sleeping pill in order to sleep, your brain adapts to the sleeping pill, and then it actually keeps you from being able to sleep unless you're taking the sleeping pill. And so if you uh, go to sleep without the sleeping pill, your brain can't sleep, and so you go for the next three months you know, with insomnia until your brain readapts. Well, in a very similar way, if a person does alcohol or heroin, um, their brain adapts to that, and then it seems normal to them. And then if they stop doing the heroin, they get cravings, which means that the brain feels like somehow this isn't normal. I feel anxious and uncomfortable uh, and miserable. I need to have some more of that substance to feel normal again. And so that's why addicts typically relapse with such high frequency. Now, in a very similar kind of way, I think what happens is, is that, let's say, um, use myself as an example. When I was 12, my, my dad suddenly died, and my mom shipped me off to a prep school. So I lost my home, my family, and I was you know, set off to this desolate island. And my brain felt miserable. I was lonely, I was unhappy, and it was severe. And my brain sort of adapted to that in some level. So um, that went on for until I finally went to college and I could begin to be with people again. But what happens is, is that when you get into a relationship and you feel connected, your brain feels, uh oh, this is danger. And it wants to go back to its homostatic normal state again, which is abandonment. And so you have to do something to recreate the familiar. And so you end up sabotaging that relationship because your brain wants to go back to that homeostatic state. Now, if you buy that theory, then the question is, how do you change that? And the answer is the same way you change a sleeping pill, which is you have to go three months um, without the sleeping pill until your brain readapts and gets redevelops those new, those old uh, neural pathways again, which it will do. In a similar kind of way, the very best way to cure somebody of an attachment disorder is to pair them up with a partner who's securely attached. It will feel extremely uncomfortable and they will push it away just like a foster child 
put into a healthy family will push away the healthy family until the brain says, hey, this is safe, I can handle this, and new receptors develop, and you begin to adapt to that in some ways. And so the real cure of this is a secure attachment. Now, the analyst had it right. You can do that in therapy, because in therapy, if you have a healthy therapist who has secure attachment, that what can do is that can begin to change the brain pathways so the person adapts to a secure attachment with the therapist and allows that to be able to occur. Um, but that assumes, of course, that the therapist has secure attachment. And that's the one thing which we don't really want to touch in the therapy field very much. I'm not touching it. Okay. All right. Any thoughts about what I'm saying? Makes, Makes sense. sense. Okay. So, Dusty Miller has a beautiful book called Women Who Hurt Themselves. And there she talks about this concept of the bystander. You want to say something about that since I've been yapping so much? Um, well, I think it goes back to Karpman in the 70s and um, the triangle, um, which is one that occurs in abusive um, and dysfunctional systems, but it, the triangle is also kind of a normative feature that just pops up in human relationship and even, I guess, non-abusive situations. But in a dysfunctional circumstance where one person has power and is perpetrating another, um, you have the perpetrator and you have the victim, and then you have on the part of the victim, a hoped for rescuer. However, the third party often is not equipped or not able or doesn't rescue and becomes instead a bystander who doesn't intervene in any effective way. And the, in a family, let's say, um, if one parent is inappropriate or abusive and the child is relying on the other parent to intervene in some effective way like mammals do um, and it doesn't happen it creates a phenomenon in which often and this is the part i think you're getting to the child is more clear about the relationship with the perpetrator than about the bystanding parent and often the bystander is themselves reduced by what's going on to a childlike state. And so the child themselves doesn't know how to feel about the bystander. And often there's a lot of um, buried feelings uh, of anger that don't get to be expressed because they're counteracted by perhaps feeling uh, sorrow or feeling I don't know, a range of ambivalent feelings that cloud the ability to feel it. So often when people get stuck in therapy that's aimed at resolving um, their disconnection from themselves, they choose the bystander over the self um, and somehow continue to blame the child as culpable in not being able to get out of the abusive situation. And it's one of the most uh, pervasive stuck points is a person's ability to reconcile the feelings for the bystander. Okay. So the key of understanding relapse is to understand the bystander phenomenon, which is why didn't mom protect me? she couldn't and why don't I stop I couldn't and so you keep telling yourself at an affective level and people can't tell the difference between I can't and I won't next slide well, it's kind of a it's a learned helplessness of sorts right so Vander Koch is one of my great heroes and when he wrote up the DSM for complex trauma what he put it is that one of the pathognomonic features of complex trauma is high susceptibility to reenactment and repetition. 
most rape victims are raped six, seven, eight times by the time they come into therapy. And it's of horrendous nature. And why is that? Somebody who's incested as a child is more likely to be raped. Why is that? It's a terrifying kind of phenomenon. And we have to ask ourselves, what is it that makes a person highly susceptible to reenactment and repetition? So the, okay, so Vander Kolk then um, was the first to really bring this idea up that trauma is sort of in the brain and in the body, and that there's this repeater system that somehow uh, is there. And he talks about it as a kindling kind of phenomena, that somehow these pathways in the brain just keep reproducing themselves over and over and over again. And so, you, for example, you see this child who's sexually abused, and then she enacts it in a variety of ways. Uh, and as she enacts it, she doesn't exactly in, her, in the top part of her brain know what she's doing. It's almost like a behavioral reenactment where she's saying, something happened to me, I don't know what it is. If I, if I make these dolls do it, then perhaps I can understand it. Lenore Terror was perhaps the, the one most robust in showing us that in the Chichilla accident where she followed those children up and each of them had a unique reenactment of being kidnapped and, and buried at a, during infancy. And so the idea of that is, is that somehow the brain sort of captured that into long-term memory. So um, what we're talking about here then was put into empirical language in what was called core relational concept. Conflict. So the core relational conflict was that each of us has an unconscious core relational conflict that we keep repeating over and over again in all of our relationships with people. And Lester Luborski uh, wrote this book called Transference, and in it, he showed empirically how bringing these people's core relational conflict into consciousness allowed them to have greater control over it. Now, I, I think that data is really is useful because in some of the newer work with metacognition, I don't know if you've been following it, but Bateman and people at, at uh, Menninger have been talking about metacognotherapy, and they borrowed some of this from Fonagy at Maudsley. And what he's been talking about is the importance of metacognition, which is being able to observe one's thoughts. And by beginning to observe one thought, you can bring something unconscious into consciousness. So what we do in trauma work is we take a person back and they help them see what they're doing. Let me give you an example. I had a client who would, was married and had kids, and he would go out and have anonymous homosexual tricks at a time when AIDS was rampant. And he couldn't stop himself from doing that. And when I was working with him in therapy, we were uh, going back to the point where his father was incesting him. And when his father was incesting him, he felt damaged, but there was this feeling inside, which he called at the time, butterflies. He says, please don't take my butterflies away. And I, I interpreted butterflies to be something in the brain that made him feel attached, connected, and loved, maybe a secure base. And so the sexual abuse was hardwired into the butterflies. And so what I did was when he went out and had these homosexual tricks, he would replicate the butterflies that he had with his father. And so I tried what Adler called spitting in the soup. Sorry for that horrible metaphor. But as he had the butterflies, I paired it with the memory of his father incesting and brought what was unconscious into consciousness. And he started to scream, you can't take that away from me. You can't take it away from me. And we stayed with it and stayed with it. And what happened was each time he had the butterflies, he began to have memories of the sexual abuse. And so then whenever he would go out and have these homosexual tricks, he would begin to have repetition memories of his father sexually abusing him. 
And that then stopped him from doing that temporarily until we could actually work through the trauma and do PTSD work. The result was that we could get him to stop this compulsive enacting. Well, that I think is a great metaphor for how a core relational conflict gets sort of hard drived into the brain and how one has to begin to bring into consciousness the unconscious and make the person aware this isn't about the here and now, it's about the then and there. So when I go to be with my this person who's drinking and it feels safe and comfortable, maybe it's about something from the past and not about the present. And I can bring in the mother drinking and bring men in and having sex in front of the child. And the person gets flooded with that when they're having sex, you know, basically uh, undesirable sex with men in adulthood. So to interpret that, just as we go along, um, it's back to the compartmentalization Repetition could only happen if there's compartmentalization. And once you like take the thing out of the Tupperware container that's been neatly labeled in the attic, and the attic's been locked, um, you have to put it back in its original context. That's what you're talking about. The reason reenactment could occur with that guy is he remembered in his body only the feeling and not the context. And I think that's so often the case with things that are even more normative than being incested by your father. So um, that's why when we do, for example, psychodramatic work of some sort, where in actuality you bring into the room the scenario and you don't just bring in like the adult's rendition of how it might have been or the 10 year old you were. But you try to look at what was the setting really like for this 10 year old? And you have people play particular roles and you try to get it just as, as close to the original scenario so you don't encumber it with lots of cognitive explanation. And when a person looks at things in that raw kind of way, it becomes harder to separate out and compartmentalize all the varying components of it. And this really is integration. And it really is this integration, this integration, not disintegration, that, um, that allows a person, I think, to have self-compassion. Because you can think a lot of times, oh, at eight years old, I should have been able to do this. Or, you know, if I had just handled it differently. When you actually revisit the real situation, you can realize why there were no alternative options really that were viable except the one chosen. And it creates a level of understanding and self-compassion that eventually is able to spread outward as well so that it really begins to reconcile the internal relationship with parts of self and self and it really begins to enable a sense of integration of the entirety of experience so that the person isn't so fragmented. And that allows true presence, which allows actually the foundation that is essential for intimacy with others and with all that is. Okay. So... I want to now turn to something more practical um, and move out of the theoretical a little bit. And I want to talk about marriage. So back as early as 1992, there was a guy named Freeman who wrote Psychodynamics of Marriage. And he wrote this beautiful statement. He said that unfinished business is a present emotional reaction shaped by a past experience. It's a reactive response guided by strong emotional experiences. Unfinished business does not allow for a thoughtful, creative response to a here and now situation. Rather, it triggers an emotionally reactive response. Who we bring in our life, our major life decisions, how we embrace important people, and the amount of closeness and distance we need emotionally are all shaped by unfinished business carried into adult life. 
relationship problems are more a reflection of unfinished business than expressions of lack of commitment, caring, and love. Boy, does <clears throat> that statement seem true to me. You know, as I've done marital therapy now for 40 years, there's a couple things I've observed. One is, is that whenever I evaluate a couple, almost never is the problem that they identify the problem. It's a problem, but it's not the problem. So most people don't know what the problem is in their relationship. And they need an outside observer to begin to assess that in some way. So they may think the problem is communication or anger or um, work or kids or whatever it may be. And it's a little bit like addiction. You know, when somebody comes in with an addiction, they think their problem is alcohol or drugs or sex or food. And that's a problem, but it's not the problem. Oftentimes, there's a problem underneath the problem. And what is the problem? The problem is typically what we're talking about today, which is unfinished business. That what's happening is this, that their life becomes what Stoller had called dedicated to reliving the trauma in disguised form. And so these, the way he says it there, the people who we bring into our life, our major life decisions, how we embrace uh, important people, the amount of closeness and distance, all shaped by unfinished business. Boy, that is so articulate. And so what people will find is this, that they have created a reactive distance that is far away, and they're lonely and miserable and anxious. And so after they've bought two new BMWs and um, a new house, they feel, feel that emptiness, and they don't know what it is. And so they go out and have an affair, and that doesn't do it, and that, they don't know what it is. And so what your the ultimate goal is insecure attachment is to teach them how to connect both to themselves and other people and to fill that emptiness inside, and that becomes the problem. I would say not to teach them how to connect, but to unblock the things that are the impediments to connection with self and others. So then Freeman said the second thing on the next slide, which is that we look for a spouse to help complete emotionally what has not been completed in our family of origin. Ask the client what they wanted from their partner that they were not able to give themselves, which elicits the deprivation in the family. They carry the fantasy with the right partner that they can feel whole, safe, and loved. So what occurs is, you know, we call it codependency. Codependency is that a person's looking for something in the partner. Oftentimes they want to change the partner um, the way they wanted to fix or change their own father. Or they want to get love out of a sponge that wasn't capable of giving love. And so they dedicate their life to trying to get something they, they cannot get. And even if they did get it, they're not it's not they're, they're reliving something from the past. They're still trying to get it from their mother or their father in varieties of ways. And therefore, even if they could get it, they would be terrified of it and they would run away from it because uh, it, what they're doing now is basically a flashback. So Masterson once said that what we do in relationships is pure projection. We take the unfinished business from our family of origin, we project it upon our partner in some way. So Laura's gonna talk a little bit about projective identification. Well, I was. <laughs> Go ahead. So, well, <clears throat> we can use a hypothetical. So let's say that hypothetically, I met Mark, perhaps hypothetically about 33 years ago. And, um, and there was something in him that I thought, wow, that's really cool. And maybe it was something that within myself, every time you sigh, it throws me off entirely. I just want to say, which you can't help sighing, but it's like, I lose my train of thought entirely. It's probably unfinished business. In any event, I met Mark and perhaps what I found really fascinating about him other than the obvious was the thing that perhaps hadn't had a chance to develop fully in me and likewise so how that plays out 
theoretically, is um, maybe Mark looked incredibly effective and capable under any circumstances. And I thought, wow, that's cool. I want to be like that when I grow up, even though I was grown up in certain ways. But that was like, wow, that's cool. He seems unflappable. And maybe in me, he saw somebody that had a um, broader range of accessible affect. Affect is like emotion, right? In case we didn't mention that. It's a kind of a fancy term that encompasses slightly more, but whatever. So maybe my full range of emotion hadn't been totally shut off. And, um, and he liked that I could cry, you know, about things that were sad. However, here's what happens, hypothetically. So when a couple get together, there really may be something that they see in one another that's an undeveloped part of self. And if seeing it in the other person, we could begin to allow it to unfold within ourselves, that would be a great use of a relationship as a vehicle for self unfolding and growth. And whether it lasted a day or a lifetime, that would be an incredibly powerful thing. But what generally happens is that instead of that, because it's really hard to look at your own stuff and two people may not be on the same trajectory with that, uh, often what happens is that a little ways down the road, the same couple that found whatever it was enticing about each other, that very same thing is actually kind of aggravating. Uh, and it may in fact become intolerable. So then down the road, in theory, you know, maybe I'm like, Mark, um, you're so able to get through any scenario, but why can't you feel? And that pushes him farther from his own feelings. And maybe he's watching me watch Hill Street Blues and he's like, Lori, my God, why are you crying about Hill Street Blues? It's just a TV show. And I'm like, these things really happen. And so the very thing that might have been appealing, if we don't allow it to nourish the possibility of development in ourselves becomes a polarization in the relationship and then it becomes irreconcilable differences and then it becomes intolerable and then it's over and on to the next relationship. However, if Mark theoretically became used the relationship as a secure base and got in touch with his feelings and re-owned the parts of self that had been sent away when tragedies occurred. And if I watched him and thought, oh, look, here's how you can deal with this effectively, then both people would grow and the relationship would deepen. Just a theory. And if you put it into the neurophysiological model, it means that you learn to tolerate things that are anxiety provoking through exposure or that are uncomfortable or irritating until your brain can readapt. Okay, so where we are is we're on page 21 for those of you who've lost us. And um, the, we're looking at Harville Hendricks. And um, page 21. So Hendricks says, unconsciously we're drawn to people who share characteristics with one or both of our parents. A person who offers us the greatest opportunity to heal our childhood wounds. Our behavior is an attempt to fill the emptiness that was once occupied by impulses, talents, interests, attitudes, attributes, inclinations, desires, and experiences that were cut out of our repertoire. So I love Harwell Hendricks uh, and Helen Huntley. Hunt. Hunt, yeah. Thank Somebody you. gave her an L.A.Y. No, no, Anyway, the, I love them and I love their writing. It's so articulate because what they caught on to was something far more profound, which was that there is this, what he called the Imago. And the Imago was um, both about negative and positive character characteristics of the people who raised you. In the Imago, he said, find three negative characteristics of the people who raised you, three positive characteristics that people raised you. What long you were a child, how do you want to feel? And how did you respond to childhood frustrations? And what you do when you identify that, it's incredibly predictive 
of what you've recreated in your marriage or romantic attraction. And so this is Patricia Love's addition to that. She said, I'm attracted to a person who is, I don't want him or her to be so that I can get and then feel, but I stop myself from getting the love I want. As you look at the answers to those questions, they resemble remarkably what's in the first one. And it's like, oh my God, can somebody be a fortune teller in some ways? And by doing this Imago work, you begin to see the great insight of what Freeman was saying, which is that the real problem in your romantic relationships is not a, between you and your partner, but what each of you has been recreating from the unfinished business from your family of origin. So the way we do marital therapy is really, I think, quite different. What we try to do is we'll start with you know, the cognitive behavioral communication and problem solving, anger management, and dealing with the here and now issues. Just like when we deal with addictions, we're going to help get under control of the addictive behavior and help them stabilize. But then after we do that, what we're going to begin to do is look at their fights and their problems as windows into the unfinished business from the past. And so we tend to work on a co therapy model. So we're going to look at him and what he's repeating. We're going to look at her and what she's repeating. And then we look at the relationship. So we see it as there's three patients. There's him, there's her, and then there's the relationship. So we're working with him in relation, working with her in relation. We're looking at what they've created between them, which is a whole new entity. And by defining it in that way, our, our therapy looks very dynamic. And one session, we may be working with him on a lot of his childhood stuff. Another issue, we'll be looking with her and her childhood stuff. But we always do it with a partner in the room. We, we don't like working with marital issues with one partner. Because usually, you get this bias. And the person comes in and gives us information that's really off in some ways. So Well, or only, it's not necessarily off. It's just only a portion of the story, and you need to see, just like an expressive therapy, you need to see it in the room in order to know what you're actually working with fully. And I would say one other thing is that the way that we work with couples typically, it's that two people become partners in healing. Um, so I think there are a lot of elements to it that uh, form the foundation for it. And it's not just about resolving the past, it's actually learning how to operate in the here and now from a position of partnership, rather than putting the problem uh, between you and act accidentally hitting the other person as you attempt to hit the problem. And we, in we incorporate the Gottman stuff and Susan Johnson and a number of other theorists you know, in being able to structure what we're doing. But the, the thing that's unique about our approach is that we're basically working on helping each person have a coherent sense of self and repair some of their attachment wounds, which is similar to Susan Johnson. So as we've said, there's three focuses, self, affect, and the relationship. And we're going to use all three of those and affect is so powerful because in a relationship you get triggered and whenever your reaction is out of proportion to the situation, you know that you're in the past and not in the present. And so for us, that's kind of a gift because it tells us the next place to go. So if the person's rageful or sad or scared or alone and disconnected, all those become doors into unfinished business from the past. It helps us do repair. Now, I want to move on to an area that Lori warns me is sort of touchy, which is this idea of illicitness in sex. Because there are a lot of people we're seeing these days go on the internet and they get more and more pornography and develop tolerance to it and need more and more illicitness in order to be able to have sex. And so they get involved in interactions that are painful or difficult or dominance and somehow injury. And uh, then they imply somehow that 
if you label it, then you're being judgmental. And the way we look at it is anything between two people that enhances intimacy can be good, and anything between two people that steals from intimacy can be bad. And so the curious thing is, why is it that tolerance develops and you get more and more bored with the partner and you need more and more illicitness? And so something extra has to come in in order to be able to turn you on. And um, that really is a very important question because I think these things somehow interfere not just with sex, but sex is just an extension of the relationship. And so that what you're looking for is how people can enjoy each other's company and how they don't need to be doing the big bang and doing extraordinary kinds of things, but can enjoy intimacy in their living room, you know, at eight o'clock at night, as well as intimacy in the bedroom. I would say it's simply, um, and I don't mean this in a reductionistic way, but I think a lot of times in general, if you can't, go deeper and i don't mean that in a sexual way i mean in total then you have to range more broadly and so i think often people think they need a lot of diversity and novelty which is not necessarily a negative but if it's instead of being able to have depth and for people to begin to actually reveal the fullness of their unique selves to one another, then it becomes problematic. So I want to be careful and say that, you know, if you want to add a, some illicitness to sex, there's nothing wrong with that. It's good. You know, anything that adds a little, you know, seasoning to the steak, so to speak, can be delicious. But when it become you become dependent upon it and the plain just looking in the other person's eyes is not enough, that's when I think it becomes potentially problematic, at least it is from our end. Okay, this is actually a quote from one of our clients. And she says, I make Judy into an object. It all starts out as a game. No, I want, I need men to desire me, to see me as a sexual being. I need men to stare at me and want me. I need to be the sexiest in the room. It gets out of control, however, when a man pursues me because I don't know how to say no. I allow myself to be used sexually because it makes me feel good. I feel loved and adored and liked. During sex, I pretend to be a fantasy, try to be everything the man wants. Many times I detach and watch. Later, I feel dirty and used and ashamed. This part of Judy demands to be emotionally detached and gets angry with the guy if he is needy. She just wants to be fucked, damn it, not loved. She feels good by being an object in fantasy. Sometimes she worries that she isn't even good enough for this. Okay, now when we have these raw data, it becomes really helpful because the question is, what do you do about this? I must say, you know, this may be true with a third of our clients that we see this so common because we, we deal with sexual abuse and trauma a lot. And this is oftentimes the sequelae of that. Um, or at least being treated uh, sex negative uh, growing up. Okay, so what I get out of this is that the person's in a highly dissociative state, that sex as affect brings out another part of her, which I might call the seductress part of her. And so this part of her somehow equated being needed in love by being a sex object. And so what happens is, that she dissociates, she goes away, another part of her takes over and decides that the only way to be able to get a man to love her is by somehow being a sex object. So Lori says that the blueprint of how we're loved as an adult is written in as a child. And if you believed as a child that the way you were loved is as a sex object, then this dissociative part comes in and gets someone to love you by becoming an object. Unfortunately though, that in the middle of the act, you come back in the room. And when that happens, it feels like you're being raped or molested all over again and becomes somehow disturbing. And so it becomes a bit sadomasochistic because it's both necessary and distressive and therefore addictive. 
Right. And I'd say again, it's not it's not a judgment about behavior per se, it's the impact of it. So does it actually narrow and maintain fragmentation or is it just additional and optional? Um, this is from Eric Fromm and um, talks about what sadism actually is. The essence of sadism is wanting to have control over another living being, complete and absolute control. The other creature can be an animal, a child, or adult, but in every case, the sadistic individual makes the other living creature his property, a thing, an object of domination. Um, if someone can make another person defenseless and force him to bear pain, that's an extreme form of control, but it's not the only one. And then it talks about teachers and prison guards in a way that teachers and prison guards would find objectionable. Um, and it talks about sadism, not just in a narrow sexual sense, but a kind of a cold sadism <coughs> that really is about um, making the other person into an object that one can mold as a potter molds his clay. Then in the last paragraph, there are even benign forms of sadism with which you all are familiar. Such sadism can turn up in all sorts of people, but Eric Fromm thinks mothers and bosses are particularly prone to it. One person controls another, not to his harm or disadvantage, but to his advantage. This is, I think, an important piece. One person controls another, not to his harm or disadvantage, but to his advantage. He tells him what he should do. Everything the subordinate should do is spelled out for him, and it is all good for him. It may indeed be good for him, or perhaps we should say profitable, but the problem with it is that he, that he loses his freedom and autonomy, loses his selfhood. And he talks about relationships of mothers to sons, when this book was written in 86, I guess. I wouldn't limit it in that way. And finally, even the victim of such sadism is unaware of it because all he sees is how he is profiting from his situation. And we're talking about sadism. And so this idea of control moves into relationships. And so dominance and submission and control becomes a theme both in the bedroom and out of the bedroom. And a lot of control issues begin to move into when a person feels scared and afraid and out of control. So I'm going to say this and we're going to take some questions. There was, there was a, a client who we're seeing and she says, there was a time at age 10, right before I was got beat to death and put in a foster home that I was babysitting while my parents were out of town. I felt so lonely and scared. I am had an empty, funny feeling inside that I had to fill. I think that's really an interesting statement. I didn't know what it was. I found myself in a room. My younger brother was asleep. He evidently was sleeping new because I really don't remember taking his unders down. I touched him down there so we could fill each other. He was asleep and looked so innocent that I really felt disgusted and I stopped. I got really sick and ran crying out because I was ashamed. I wonder if he remembers it. I'm sure he does. So this is a, a female who was sexually abused, obviously, and physically and emotionally abused. And in the depths of therapy, what she reveals to us is, is that she hates herself, not just because of what was done to her and her internal uh, processing of those events, but then what she went on to do to others um, which she's never talked about before. And so she feels like she's become her perpetrator. And in analytic language, the idea was that we carry our interject. Often we carry our perpetrator with inside of us. And somehow the brain pathways are such that if you want to feel powerful or powerless, your perpetrator was powerful, you were powerless. So you interject the powerful and that that's inside of us in some ways. And so all of us have this dark side to our personality. And this dark side, we feel ashamed of. And 
oftentimes we don't ever disclose to anybody, but it becomes the source of our badness because anybody, if anybody ever knew that we had such thoughts and feelings, they would know that we're certainly bad. So the question is what to do about this interject of the perpetrator that many of our clients carry within us and then enact in varieties of ways, either by stealing, lying, cheating, uh, having affairs, or having a secret life in some ways. Well, again, um, I would transform this into its more um, typical application, which is identification with the aggressor, as it used to be called, is I think a feature of most everyone, um, anyone certainly that was reared in a shame-based culture, which ours is. And so instead of identifying, to go back to Alice Miller in the very beginning of this, with the child we once were, we identify with um, the aspect of things that occurred to that child that was punitive and with punishing ourselves into a state of improvement. And I would say that for intimacy and integration to actually occur, we would have to begin to go back and question uh, really all our assumptions and to see the places where we still parent ourselves as we were parented or parent ourselves as our parents attempted not to parent us, but parent ourselves in the context of a shame-based, punitive, beat yourself into progress mentality. And the degree to which this is pervasive is I think fundamental to what's problematic about relationships because at some level, we look for someone who will treat us lovingly, but until we can actually have compassion for the split off parts of ourselves and the injured parts of ourselves and the vulnerable parts of ourselves, we can't receive that kind of unconditional love and acceptance, even if another person were capable of giving it. So, Maybe I'm getting too old, but I fear that we're going the wrong direction with this because with the internet, there's more and more people sort of getting into this in a pornographic way and deciding that, you know, that what they're doing, they're proud of. And so the issue then is, is that they're enacting trauma in disguised form and it's an act of hostility that gets somehow um, hardwired into their sexual acting, and then through classical and operant conditioning, you know, gets hardwired in over and over and over again, and becomes both necessary and distressing. And then they go on the internet, and there's a, a thousand other people who are doing the same thing, and then they begin to feel, oh, I shouldn't feel shame about that, I should feel pride, there's nothing wrong with it in some way. Now, I'm not a person who wants to now label that as sick or problematic and make a problem when there isn't one. But at the same time, as I think we're missing the door that they're enacting a lot of the violence of our childhood. And that and somehow it's not just in sex, but it's outside the bedroom too, because they're coming in you know, on heroin and uh, they're coming in with, you know, one relationship after the other, the sixth marriage, and they're missing the problem that's in front of them. And their sexual behavior is only a, a kind of like a barometer of their intimacy issues outside the bedroom. Well, again, I like to make it not so much them and us since we're no farther along necessarily than anyone else, just because you can talk about something intellectually doesn't mean that you've evolved fully. Um, but what I wish is that we wouldn't characterize things as 
categorically something to feel shame about or something to feel pride in. I wish that um, I wish that it it were possible for us to realize that um, transformation doesn't occur without acknowledgement. And I wish that we could be freer of shame so that we could look at things and decide for ourselves, you know, does this narrow the range of possibility or does this expand it and make independent decisions in that way in terms of what occurs between consenting adults, but at a deeper level um, that's not about any particular realm, the sexual or the romantic, but that's about all realms. Um, what I think is essential is that we question all our presumptions and be able to, by not categorizing things, to not dismiss them. Because whether everyone did the best that they could or not, there are still things in every generation that we need to recalibrate in terms of our own personal evolution. And I also wish that it were somehow possible to think in broader terms than, you know, let's do six weeks of therapy and see if I'm cured when the evolution of an individual should really be lifelong. And if it were to be able to proceed without shame and without needing to fit into a certain category and without becoming associated with your diagnosis to the extent that you cease to be a human being, then it would be a lifelong evolution that was really about education and inquiry and growth and relationship. And I'm not sure that this entire thing was necessarily a really happy Valentine's Day presentation, <laughs> but thanks for joining us. Let's take some questions. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you work with somebody with somebody who has affairs, and I missed the second part of that. Suzanne, do you have that question? Yeah. Says, I work with numerous clients who have affairs. They have a genuine connection with the intimate person and see them as closer to their match, but don't want to give up their current relationship where the intimacy is no longer there. Yeah, I, I, let's see if I can say something intelligent about that. I think that we're all heading towards the light. And so what that means is that, and Lori's saying that some, sometimes as we get healthier, um, and we grow, um, what attracts us also grows. And so the person that you meet may be the next step in your own evolution and your growth. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the other side of that can happen. It can be a dark energy. And the dark energy is, is that you're looking for the big bang and of course, anything new, like a new car or a new house, is exciting. And uh, but you can't have your cake and eat it too, can you? And so, you know, Lori says maybe. I I don't think it's a good idea to have your cake and eat it too, because what happens is is that um, someone's going to get hurt. And I don't think that um, that intentionally hurting another person who you love um, is uh, part of one's positive evolution. So, you know, I think that there are alternatives to that and honesty and integrity are certainly the rules that I think are critical to any relationship. So I don't know, I don't think it's necessarily good or bad. I, I've worked with many, many relationships with these kind of affairs that it's really woken the couple up and they realized that their relationship had been going on atrophy. And all of a sudden now the relationship's on fire and they re rekindle that which they once had. And it's, you know, they both say that although the affair was miserable, it actually was the best thing that happened to them. Um, and of course the opposite's true too. Right. So the question was how to help the person and Somewhat as Mark's saying, although some of what you said sounded a little bit potentially judgmental, 
I think it really depends on the circumstances uh, as to what it what does it stand for and what does it allow. I think usually the difficulty with affairs is the deception, and that usually the deception piece um, creates a huge stumbling block. And I think some people get around that nowadays by choosing to have open relationships, which may or may not be a way of tackling the issue, it may be a way of bypassing the issue. So it really is, I think, highly contingent on the circumstance as to whether somehow it's about growth or somehow it's about something uh, that keeps things in a holding pattern. So when I have people that are um, trying to choose between two partners, I often find that the issue is not about choosing between two people in the world. The issue is something a bit deeper that's unreconciled internally with kind of an internal polarization. And so strangely enough, it often works best to look at uh, what's going on internally before any decisions get made externally so that the same thing doesn't just replicate itself when the passion settles. Do you have an example of that? Well, um, no, I think sometimes people leave a partner because they're forced to deaden an aspect of themselves in the relationship over time. And so in the interest of self-preservation, if you will, or self-resuscitation, they find a partner who can feed that part of themselves. And so it's a legitimate and reasonable thing. But then the sorrow can occur when the same roles get replicated in a relationship where you think you're getting freedom and then somehow both parties, rather than getting the liberation they were thinking, recreate a circumstance that is exactly what they didn't want. And so what I'm in favor of is growth. Um, and so rather than labeling, I just think it's really a useful thing to look at what's going on at all levels. What did you have to sacrifice and what are you hoping to find? And how can that receive some liberation regardless of what partner you're with? And then that allows the decision to be made from a different position that somehow um, could become clarifying. Any other questions? You guys, there's one here that says, um, how do you suggest helping the client reconcile continuing with the affair or to be honest with all parties? Yeah, well, that's a good question too, because again, it depends on the reason, right? Because the same behavior in different circumstances can be precisely right or precisely wrong. That's what's so confusing, uh, I think. And it depends why, you know, are you, why? You know, why was it a secret and why would you now um, tell the other person? And is it for the betterment of the situation or is it um, for the sake of some need for confession in a way that will actually damage all parties. So I'm not big on deception in general because I think it's hard on everyone concerned. Um, and it makes people feel kind of crazy because you know their perceptions aren't reality. And it kicks up a lot of dust just at a variety of levels. But I also think that um, looking at the reasons for not talking about it and then looking at the reasons for talking about it are equally important and timing and context can be everything. Well, in a simple way, what I would say is that an affair is always a cause of help. And it's always a sign that there's something either in the individual or in the couple that is not uh, working. 
and it's a sign that you need to, to go in and try to uh, figure out what that is and repair it. And so ignoring it, it would be fairly dangerous. And just one other um, additional thought. Again, Dick Schwartz, the creator of Internal Family Systems, wrote a book uh, entitled, what's the name of that book? The person you're looking no, for. No, no, you're the one you've been looking for. So at some level, um, I think maybe that can be more where the clarification is than in the external and understanding, um, again, what, what you're looking for may shed light on how you're looking for it, where it can be found and how it can be sustained. And of course, the big thing is emptiness, loneliness. You can feel lonely with people, and then you feel like something's wrong with you, and there is something wrong with you. Not more than any of the rest of us, though. OK. Suzanne? Yeah, there's another question here. Do you have time for one more? Sure. How does one have a committed, intimate relationship that is also an open relationship? I think two people have to figure that out together. Um, I think some people nowadays choose monogamy and some people choose polyamory and some people choose celibacy. There are all kinds of choices. And I think, again, it depends more on the why than the what. I think there are ways to have any number of decisions with integrity and there are ways to have any number of decisions that are somehow diminishing. And so that's a determination that can only be made, I think, by the person in their internal world and the person and those closest to them. Sorry, if that was evasive, but it's very hard to say something specific that wouldn't be untrue. Because it depends more on the why than the what. And there's one last comment here, which is, which reads, I think of the impact of these issues upon the therapist and the almost necessary introspection as they face and present to the client such challenging issues and or approaches. It is so difficult not to constantly question and validate what you discuss with your clients when aiming at improvement in the individual and any number of relationships, past and present. Any thoughts or suggestions? Well, I hope that, um, I hope that, therapists, and I know that I feel the constant um, the constant resonance between what comes up for others and what's true for me, because we're all human beings, and that's why that's why I'm a believer in what can happen in group therapy um, as an essential adjunct often to a one-on-one -on -one therapeutic relationship because there's so much to be learned in the interaction. And so I hope that even as therapists are there to fulfill a role um, that has specific boundaries, I hope that we're all learning every second and questioning and growing and looking at our stuck points and evolving and hopefully shaming ourselves less about the process. I don't know, I just find it very fulfilling. I just find it, the inner, the inner world of the individual, uh, when it gets exposed in the therapy room, um, you just feel more compassion for the other and more compassion for their suffering, the pain that they're enduring. And, you know, you're sort of brought into that world and when you do, you just get, you know, some kind of microscope into their soul. And out of that, something beautiful can occur. So, I don't know, I always felt like, you know, choosing this profession has always been such a joy and the luckiest person in the world. On that note, thank you all for coming in and joining us. It's been fun. And I've written a paper on this, as you may guess. And uh, if you want, I'll send you a copy of the paper, which 
has uh, most of what we've been talking about in it. Thank you. Bye-bye.